I'll just copy the URL of this link into Discord. So what I'm going to, there's far too much material for me to cover on Spring and Kubernetes in half an hour. So what I've done is I've prepared a bunch of stuff here and I'm just going to walk through as much of it as I can, pick, pick out some of the best bits. Um, and I've given you the URL so you can uh, have a look at it yourself offline when, if you need to. So the first thing I'm going to do is bring up an empty project in um, VS Code. So this is, um, it's empty, but it's got this readme in it. And I'm going to talk about what you might do if you were having your first experience with Kubernetes. And um, there's also some stuff here on new features in Spring Boot. So layered jars, probes, graceful shutdown, um, hot reload. I might get that far. Um, I'm hoping to get that far, but we'll, if I don't, and there's other good stuff that you could uh, work through on your own here later. It's all supposed to be self-contained. So it tells you what you need, prerequisites. So we're going to need some Java. We're going to need a Kubernetes cluster. I've got one of those. Let's just check that it's working. Cube cuddle. Get all. Okay. So there's a Kubernetes cluster running with nothing in it. I've got cube cuddle. I'm going to use customize, which um, if you didn't know about it, is actually built into cube cuddle now these days. Um, but I'm going to use it on the command line as well. I'm going to use scaffold to take away some of the toil. And I'm not going to get as far as the bit where I use um, Apache Bench. So um, that's probably all we need to get started. So what do we do when we uh, when we want a Spring Boot application? We go to the initializer. And I could do that in the, UR, in the uh, IDE. But since I'm a command line kind of guy, I'm just going to do a curl command, which is going to pull down a project. Here we, now we've got a Java project, see? And the um, Java tooling will start up in VS Code. If I look at the application code, there we go, Spring Boot application. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is create uh, a really simple RESTful endpoint or HTTP endpoint. Call it home. And there we go. So it's just going to say hello world. I'm sure I don't need to prove to you that that works. Um, so I want to deploy this application into my Kubernetes cluster. The first thing I need is a container. So I might start with a Docker file. So let's just make a Docker file. Docker file. And, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but you can tell because I've copy and pasted that, um, I prepared this in advance, um, but there's quite a lot of detail in this Docker file, and it's definitely um, boilerplate to a large extent. But it's also it also represents a large number of choices that I had to make. And I just want you to bear that in mind as we work through um, the rest of this the rest of this demo. So um, I could, if you notice what I did in that Docker file, I assume that we already have a jar file. So I'm copying. The application jar file into the container and so the first thing i need to do is build it and hope that my maven cache is primed it's using spring boot 2.2 so it shouldn't i shouldn't need any snapshot downloads here we go tests are running That gives me a jar file, and now I can build a Docker, Docker image. That didn't take long. All right. Um, I'm using a local host registry just so I don't have to get stuff in and out of Docker Hub or some remote registry. So I can run that image now just to make sure that it works. Docker run. And terminal to curl it and make sure that it works. Hello world. Okay, so I've got a container. Let's push it into the registry. 
fine. Okay, brilliant. Now I can uh, send it to Kubernetes. And actually, I'm going to skip over this bit. So you can, you probably know this, you can, um, without knowing any YAML, you can create, YAML, use Kubernetes kubectl to create a YAML file and then apply it. And that will get you into the cluster. But I'm going to do it with customize because I like that. And I'm going to show you something that you might not have seen before. Um, so jumping ahead a couple of sections where it says modularize. Okay, so let's say um, we, the, the bit that we skipped was we did have a Kubernetes directory. So K8, and I'm just going to create a customization.yaml in that directory. So, and that's going to be um, just count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine lines of YAML. That's my kind of YAML, right? Everybody hates YAML. Um, I don't particularly. I kind of quite like the fact that I can read everything. What what I hate is boilerplate, and everybody um, who uses Spring knows that we hate boilerplate, right? So this is a uh, showing you a technique that you can use to, I guess, modularize and and um, uh, simplify your YAML so that you can get away, get rid of some of the boilerplate. So all the boilerplate is here in a different repository that's in actually in GitHub. Um, but you could do it with local files as well. So you could have local um, layers, they call them, and customize. And all it really needs to do is it needs to know um, something about the template that's there. So the template has an image with a dummy name, and it also has um, or it has, you'll see it has a name of the, the name for um, the uh, um, deployment and the service that I'm going to create. So let's see what happens. Um, so I could customize build k8. Do you build a directory that has customization.yaml in it? And if I did that, then it would spit out a bunch of YAML three documents onto standard out. So I can therefore use that to. apply to my cluster. So uh, let me just um, watch what happens when I do that. So watch cube cuttle get all. So nothing there at the minute, but as soon as I apply this, something's going to happen, right? So it created a config map, it created a service, and it created a deployment. And uh, the apps are actually already running. Um, I can't connect to it directly because it's running inside the cluster, but I've got this um, IDE plugin here from uh, VS Code, so I can look at what's been deployed. There's a, there's a deployment here called App, and it has a pod running that you could see in my terminal as well there. And in the network side, you've got a service also called App, which I can port forward to. So it's going to ask me for the port. So let's say I want to put it on a local port 8080, and I know that it's listening on port 80. That will do something magical there. And then I can curl it, right? Curl localhost 8080 and expect to see my message. There we go. Hello, world. Cool. Um, do I need to keep that port forward there? Let's assume that I don't. So I'm going to kill that. Kill that. And um, <clears throat> oh, actually, I should have kept it because I'm going to show you something else with that customization. So that's that's a nice thing, right? Because um, I generated, I don't know, we could count them um, 40, 50 lines of YAML. I could have generated 500 lines of YAML, all with a simple input file that has kind of you know, um, very obvious structure. And I've done that by abstracting away this um, base layer. It's becoming quite a common thing to do because I don't know if you knew it, but um, kubectl actually has this built in. So if I do apply minus k, k8, then that will do the same thing in, in theory. In practice, it doesn't always because customize has different versions and not all of them are 
they're not all up to date in kubectl so that that might work but it, the, I, the the point is i make i'm making is that kubectl has customized built in if you haven't seen it before it's definitely worth checking out so the next thing i'm going to try doing is i'm going to add um because i know that i used actuators in my um spring boot app so i'm going to add a little extra transformation of my yaml there so if i do that and apply it again something will happen over here we'll be watching over here for there we go so um a new deployment well not a new deployment a new replica set was created so the new pod is now running uh, this is the new one it's not yet ready and the reason it isn't ready is because it's now got a readiness probe right that's what this actuator transformer did so that's a choice that i can make in basically one line of yaml and it will give me um extra stuff that's useful for spring boot applications and where are we um so if we looked at the the actual yaml for the deployment now we can see that in the ide here you can see it's created a liveness probe and a readiness probe and that was the effect of adding that transformation basically so that's cool um and in case you're wondering um if this is going to be uh, some you know sort of official shipping um format for spring boot or spring applications the answer is already yes because the spring data flow team are already shipping customizations as they're if you're deploying spring data flow on kubernetes the latest version this is how you do it basically um can you hear me okay because um i'm getting a message from zoom saying that my internet... yeah we can hear you okay good fine so it's just worrying unnecessarily so data flow is using customize um i reckon this is you could write your own of these right or you could use mine i don't really care um uh, i don't promise to support that that library of layers but it's actually pretty simple to set up and if you look at that that um github uh, repository you'll see loads of samples loads of different layers um there's a pet clinic there that you can deploy actually which i think we do later on in this um this tutorial if you work through all, all the way to the end so um i deployed that um i could probably curl it again and prove that it works but i'm sure you believe me it says it's running right and it replaced the so the new pod replaced the old one um and now it has liveness and readiness probes whether you choose to use liveness and ready readiness probes it's really it really is up to you right i don't i don't think i can um mandate that but i can show you how to do it and do it in one line so that's kind of cool so that was adding liveness and readiness probes basically from that transformation i mean so you could have you could have you know uh other library features like you could um add prometheus logging or you could add um metrics you know with Pr prometheus that so, so there's a feature that sort of works out of the box in kubernetes for that you could add um i don't know use your imagination you could add um credentials for a database you could add that as a as a transformation that kind of looked for a config map or a secret with a, a, a well-known name or something like that anything that you can do in your yaml basically any patch that you can apply to the uh, kubernetes yaml can be expressed roughly speaking as a customization um so the next thing i'd like to show you is um sort of the first step in the uh the road to continuous delivery and GitOps and things like that. Um, it's a tool that actually comes from Google called Scaffold. If you haven't seen it, it's definitely worth checking out. Um, it's a little bit of a gateway drug, drug. Once you get started with it, you don't like to stop. Um, and I'll show you why. Because um, although so far I've, I've, I haven't had very much toil, right? I've been using lots of shortcuts and uh, cutting corners to, to make things work. Think about what I would have to do if I wanted to change my application code and then get it running in the cluster. Um, there's quite a few steps that I'd have to go through, right? The, um, make the change, build the jar file, containerize it, um, 
push it to the registry with a, a new label and I've got to make the label up somehow. And then I've got to edit the YAML. Um, even if it's only just one line, I've got to do quite a lot of steps to get the, the next version into the cluster. So what Scaffold is going to do is basically take all of that toil away. So I'm going to create a new file called scaffold.yaml. And I'm going to copy this code into it. So what that's saying is I want you to build an image with that label and I want you to use Docker. And then I want you to deploy that container from a customization in the K8s directory. So it's pretty simple. Yeah, it's only just a few lines and I'm gonna get quite a lot of value out of that. So the command to do that is scaffold dev. And then I'm gonna do ask it to give me a port forward. So it's using the Docker file that I already created. It's rebuilding that container and it made itself a nice unique label name look like that. So yeah, so I got a new version running already. It's not quite ready. It'll show me the logs when it's ready. It's just waiting for that readiness probe to be fired. There we go, it's running. And so there's the log from the startup of the application. It's also giving me a port forward automatically. So I don't have to keep dipping in and out of the um, port forward if I want to. Um, quickly interact with the application locally. So 4503 is now, oops, curl, idiot. It sometimes takes a little bit of time for that to set up. There we go, so it's hello world. Um, so let me show you why this is neat. Uh, I mean, it's neat because it did all that work without me doing anything. But if I was to change my endpoint, um, it's not going to, the way that I've set it up currently, it's not going to detect that straight away. I'll, if I get to it, I'll show you how to do that later. Um, and the reason is because I'm using Docker and the Docker file assumes there's a jar file. So I need to rebuild that jar file. So you might like this level of you know, um, control. I, can, I have to make a jar file. So I have to take some action to make it, you know, rebuild the app and send it to the cluster. Um, so there's a question in Discord about Maven tooling. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Um, Jib is definitely useful, but um, there's something else I want to show you today. So when that jar has been built in the middle window here, uh, which is <clears throat> now, there we go. Scaffold has detected it and is rebuilding the container. Don't take long. Now it's starting to deploy it. So we might see over in the Kubernetes window, we'll see that start to change. Here we go. So it's already deployed. Yeah, so um, somebody just mentioned build packs in Discord as well. That's where I'm headed, basically. If I get time, that's where I'll get to. So um, where's my readme? <clears throat> oh, there's one last thing I wanted to show you with um, Scaffold. So this is now running again. Um, so I'm sort of doing it in dev mode, scaffold dev. Um, you can also use it as you know part of a continuous delivery uh, tool chain. Um, and then you use different profiles. So it's the same configuration file, but you sort of a different process. What's nice about this is if I just kill scaffold, it cleaned up the cluster for me. So I didn't have to you know, remember how to do that. I kind of like that. So it's taking a lot of to toil away. So then that, that brings me to, um, yeah, some of the things that have been, you've been asking about in the uh, um, uh, Discord room. So what kind of features does Spring Boot have that will help you um, in Kubernetes? I should prefix, I think, this um, part of the conversation by um, just spouting a bit of Kubernetes philosophy. So the sort of, um, the, 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 the rubric says from you know the the the, origin, the developers the the engineers behind Kubernetes that if you're running an app on Kubernetes it shouldn't be aware of that like so any app ought to be able to run on Kubernetes because it shouldn't have to know that it's running there and that's true up to a point 
Um, and it also means that any features that we add to Spring Boot to help you run in Kubernetes will basically help you run in any cloud native situation, basically. Any any application can benefit from these features. So um, this thing has been in Spring Boot for since the beginning, right? The fact that you can load properties files and YAML files. Oops, I did want that preview. Thank you very much. Properties files and YAML files from well-known locations. You can let you can use that feature, right? You can um, take um, configuration from various different sources, config maps maybe in Kubernetes secrets. You can mount them into um, volumes, local volumes on the pod that's running in, in Kubernetes and you can give give it a well-known file name like application.properties and it will just read the data out. And Spring Boot can already do that. So you can use um, the, 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 pl the platform to sort of prime um, features of Spring Boot. Um, so there's lots of auto configuration then that you can that you can use for things like databases, message brokers, et cetera. That's already built into Spring Boot, right? Um, we also have some support for decryption of secrets if they've been encrypted in Spring Cloud and Spring Cloud Vault. And there is also a project called Spring Cloud Kubernetes. So some of the features in Spring Cloud Kubernetes, you have to be aware of this, require direct access to the Kubernetes API, and you might not have that in a production setting. So I think this, the emphasis of the, on this project is shifting slightly. So if you watch the next couple of releases, um, Ryan Backstrom in particular has been working on it and he's starting to come up with neat ideas for um, actual, actual applications, if you like, Kubernetes controllers that we can host in this project. And instead of instead of it being a library, it's more of a sort of um, a library of you know application features. It's more of an a library of applications, if you like, so things that you can embed in your application if you have access to the Kubernetes API, like um, you know, service discovery abstractions or um, config changes. So if if, one, if a config map changes, you can kick the uh, application using Spring Cloud features to go and read the, read the properties file again. So nothing in Kubernetes will do that automatically, right? You sort of need something in the application. And so you can set up a, a Kubernetes controller to do that. Um, there, so then somebody mentioned build packs. I'm going to show you that next. So this is new. So the plus sign there means that it's new in Spring Boot 2.3. Um, so you could, there we have now um, Maven and Gradle tooling for building containers. Um, we always had actuators, and we've seen those in action today already. So you can use those as liveness and readiness probes and other, and other things. Prometheus, I already mentioned as well. Um, you can and you always have been able to separate the port of the, on that for that as well. So you can you can run your actuators on a different port than the main application. That might be a good idea. Some people like it, some people don't. So we don't say one way or the other whether you should do uh, do that, but you can. And Kubernetes will allow you to just configure the liveness probe on a different port. That's fine. Um, there are a couple of things to watch out for with that, which is that it's because it's listing on a different port, um, you don't necessarily know <laughs> if your main application port is um, unhealthy. Then the 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 readiness probe could be um, could be could be green um, because they're not actually sharing the same infrastructure. So there are some plus sides and and minus sides for for using a separate port. You have to decide. Um, another new thing, which I might have time to show in detail, but I doubt it, is um, there are now separate actuator endpoints, which are specifically for liveness and readiness. So before we had um, things that you could use um, in case you needed liveness and readiness, but they weren't specifically designed for that. So this isn't really a Kubernetes concern, but Kubernetes sort of brings it to the surface because it has these features sort of built into it. The other thing we've added in 2.3 is uh, some graceful shutdown features. So um, there's some notes on that later on, and I don't think I'm going to have time to talk about it in detail. But um, suffice to say, until Spring Boot 2.3, uh, when an application shuts down, if you send it SIGTERM, then 
the application context closes, but the ordering isn't always as nice as it should be. So you could be, you could lose, you could drop connections basically, or you could um, lose access to a database in the middle of the processing of a connection. And so we've tried to limit the amount of uh, um, ungraceful shutdown, I guess. You, you can't be completely watertight about this, but you can definitely offer new features. So there's some new features in Spring Boot 2.3 for this. Um, yes, Scaffold definitely can be integrated with the Spring Boot 2.3 tooling. There's a section in this readme about that later on. I won't get to it, but, um, well, I might. Actually, I've got 10 minutes, I might. Um, so then, okay, so build pack images. This is, this is what you need to do. So you've got, you need uh, Spring Boot 2.3. So let me just hack my POM so that it's the right version and then um, has the repositories that I need. Okay, so with Spring Boot 2.3, you can, I can get rid of that Docker file. Okay, it's some, that's sometimes a little bit unclear when people do give these demos. I don't need a Docker file. <laughs> I do just run Maven or Gradle Spring Boot build image, and I'm gonna actually tell it what the image name should be. I could put that in the com file as well, of course. So it's gonna run a normal Maven build. So that's just um, completely just running this, the tests and everything just as you'd expect. And when it's finished the tests, it will go into the container build. Here we go, building image. So it, it's pulling images from Google there. Did you see? Let me just uh, expand that. So it's build. It's pulling a, an image to build inside. So this thing, Paquito, is uh, the new brand that they've given to basically the the build pack implementations that VMware builds. Um, so it's had a look at um, Java, executable jars, Tomcat in case that was needed. A zip file in case I was trying to build a zip file and it's got a spring boot build pack. Uh, now it's I, I slow down a bit because it's this time it's downloading the JDK. Next time I do it, it won't have to do that. It does cache. Um, but um, that will take a minute. So maybe I can look for questions while that's, while that's building. Have someone get somebody up and running with build packs for scaffolds. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll show you how to do that in one second. <clears throat> Can scaffold be integrated? Yes, I, that, was, that was exactly what I was gonna show you in a minute. Um, okay, so it's got the JRE, the JDK and the JRE. Oh no, yeah, here we go, here we go. It's doing it. It's like 150 megabytes, right, the JDK. So I, I don't have a very fast internet connection here, but it's cached it now. So it, I, if I did it again, it would finish in like five seconds, the whole thing in five seconds. Um, so it built the image and uh, I still need to push it. Push, there we go, so that's a different image. It's got the same application code in it, but if you were to look at it, um, I could say docker inspect localhost. Oops. Oh, what was I calling it? Apps demo. So let's look at that container quickly here. Oops, see there's a load of stuff there. This um, this in particular is interesting. So there's loads of metadata. So this this tells you what the build pack did. This tells you um, about the uh, that tells you a, a bit more more detail about what the which build packs ran when. This bit is interesting. So this is here you go. You can see you've got all your dependencies there. So we're adding annotations to the, the container, and those can be used at runtime, right, by the um, platform. So for instance, we could, you could have a, a Kubernetes feature that sniffed the container before it deployed it. And if it thought that you were trying to do metrics with Prometheus, for instance, it could add 
um, you know, um, the right declarations to get your the right annotations to get your application lighting up in Prometheus. So you can you can use that uh, metadata in various ways. Also for auditing, I guess people like to do that kind of thing, right? Um, so let me just see if I can get to the point where I do that in Scaffold, and then here we go. You're using a Spring Boot Docker image for Scaffold, and then I'll um, open it up for questions. So I'll change my scaffold to that. All right, so I've got a build command, which is um, the Maven build command that I just did. And what they do in scaffold is they give you an environment variable dollar image. So if you can build dollar image and push it, then you're in business basically. So that's that. And um, then I can just run it, I think. And it's going to run that build again, and you'll see that it's quicker. <laughs> OK, so it's running in tests. Those don't take very long. Um, so the, there's one last thing that I would have shown if I'd had time, which I don't, which is you can use Spring Boot DevTools with the same tool chain. And then you can, so Scaffold has this nice feature that it um, you don't have to go through the whole build if you can tell it how to send just the changes. And so um, it will change, it will send the changed file. So it will send all of your classes as they are changed and you can make changes to the application and get them deployed instantly that way. <clears throat> yeah, so it's finished doing the build of the container already. It started to deploy it and there we are, we're up and running. Not, re not, not yet ready, but we're up and running, up and running. I don't know how you spell, how you pronounce Paquito, actually. I've just, uh, I just made that up. <laughs> it's borrowed from the Greek. Ah, good. Yes, I'm sure it is, actually. Paquito. Paquito. I've heard people say Paquetto as well, so maybe that's what you're supposed to say. Um, yes, you can use custom base images. Um, you can also customize the build packs, so that's the neat thing about it. I mean, you can the, the the aim with this tooling, with the build pack tooling, is to sort of get you on the right path. So um, you can run them from the command line, like, command line like I just did, but it's kind of better to have that build happen in, uh, inside a pipeline, right, in a continuous delivery pipeline. And then there are tools and um, you know services that you can consume um, that will allow you to standardize all your builds and do neat things like the one thing the one of the big selling points of um, build packs is that you can change the base image of images you've already built. So if you have a security vulnerability that it can be patched in a base image, then you can get that rolled out to your all of your apps, thousands of them, right, automatically without having to intervene at all. So that's kind of neat. Um, there was one other thing. Yeah, so this, this is also useful to know. So um, when the application runs in that container that was built by the build pack, it actually calculates a memory requirement. It doesn't just fall back on the default JVM settings, which are generally not very good and won't make the best use of the space that you've got in the container. So we run a memory calculator, which is the same one that we've already run, always run in, in Cloud Foundry. We run that before the application runs so that we can set the JVM command lines and you'll get the best bang for your buck that way. You can configure it, but um, we've done quite a lot of testing over the years of um, specifically spring apps but it works quite well for any jvm app actually um so there's there's a, a nice feature that you can see immediately of the build packs um so i think i'm out of time and i uh sergi um tell me yeah we can uh, uh go uh, over the questions on discord maybe uh we can uh well i just collect some of the questions you have done a great job answering some of them already so you showed that you master concurrency as well <laughs> yeah <Yes>. in real <laughs> life <laughs> <laughs> lovely so we can go uh over some questions uh the first one is uh, what is your opinion on helm uh, versus uh, customize um I 
don't personally have an opinion, but I I don't like using Helm. <laughs> it seems much more complicated. I mean, for what I need to do, customize is perfect, right? I just, all I want to do is just take the pain out of um, getting a deployment YAML together. Um, people who know more about these things tell me that uh, Helm, while it's very convenient and we use it at VMware, we sell products to, based on Helm, um, it's... Um, it's difficult to manage upgrades. So it's great to get something into the cluster, but if you want to keep maintaining it, that can become a bit of a challenge. Um, and specifically, if you want to change custom resource definitions, I think it has issues. So uh, there are some technical reasons why it's, why some people prefer customize, and that's actually why they went with the uh, customize with Dataflow, incidentally. They, they looked at everything, including Helm, and went with customize in the end. Partly because it's built into Kubernetes, I think that sort of gives it a stamp of approval. But um, yeah, um, right. That's that's what I know about Helm. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, let's jump into the next one. Uh, would you recommend using Jeep when building Docker images, or just write our own to control everything? I definitely don't recommend writing your own Docker file. I mean, I did that for the demo, but that fills me with many, many misgivings and fears. <laughs> so yeah, go ahead and use Jib. Um, but there is an alternative, which is this build pack approach that we've um, promoted in the Spring Boot tooling. Right, so a lot of people are actually asking for the difference between uh, Jib and uh, using the build tools. Uh, the, the end result is kind of similar. I mean, you won't, for instance, you won't get this, you won't get the um, uh, memory calculator running at, uh, in the uh, container. You don't get um, that metadata that I showed you, so you can like inspect the container and work out the dependencies. Um, I mean, I'm sure that you can configure Jib to do anything, but like mm -hmm. out of the box, the experience is just slightly different and it has some differences that we think are significant. And also, you know, when you get to the point that you want to do a, a real CD pipeline, we think build packs are a better choice, but you know, it doesn't matter. You, you'll get you'll get there um, either way. I'm pretty, right. pretty it's sure. a matter of choice. Yeah. It's a little bit a matter of choice, yeah. Um, so there's a question in Discord about what do you need to run the tooling. Um, you do need a Docker daemon locally. Yeah. Well, you need you need access to a Docker daemon. It, it could be a remote one actually. So um, you can you can that means you can do it in a CI platform, but. Um, it's uh, it's kind of a little bit of a um, an implementation detail. We chose to do that because so many people do have um, Docker or Podman. I think also works. I think you so I think you can do it on a um, standard CentOS system, for instance. Um, right. Some other people ask also what version of the the boot plugin do I need the for Spring Boot the build image? So, so it's Spring about time, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, so I use two point three RC one. I think the release date is like Monday or something. They're they're working furiously hard on two point three. It's coming out very soon. Yeah. Um, um, yeah with, if I was using Jib, I could use Jib in exactly the same way that I just did. Right. I could set up my Maven card, command as a custom build. That would work. I think that we have time for uh, just uh, one question. So, do you have any experience running applications with Spring Cloud Kubernetes on OpenShift? Is there anything special um, to consider? I, personally, I don't. Um, but it was that project was started by some guys at Red Hat, so I'm pretty sure they were using it on OpenShift. I, I mean, the intention is that it works in any cluster, right? Um, there are some, um, you know, wiggle differences in OpenShift I'm aware of, um, but I don't think. I mean, one of the, the biggest thing that you might run into is that. Um, you know, that thing that I said about the API access, if you don't have access to the API, then some of the features in that project just don't work. And that will not be the default in most OpenShift clusters, I shouldn't think. Um, so, you know, there are some features that, that you need to have permission to use, so we say, but otherwise it's, uh, it's just vanilla Kubernetes. Very good. All right. Thank so you thank much. you very much. Uh, we have a lot of in interaction on 
our Discord channel. See oh, here a couple of times. Spring Boot 2.3 was released. Somebody, somebody noticed yep. and I did. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> Nicole, uh, Stefan Nicole had just told me this morning, so I was really happy uh, that it happened right. before the conference. Uh, brilliant. <laughs> I, I didn't realize. Like, I didn't yeah, yeah. it. Oh, well, never mind. All right, great. Well, yes. thank you very much. Uh, so yes, let's uh, have a break. Right. And yep, and I'll see you in uh, about five minutes.